Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. This is one of my favorite shows because I have the privilege of having Mary Joyce with me. But before I talk to her, uh, talk to her and talk about her, I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for the amazing intro. Please look for him on the internet. He's a native storyteller, and he will amaze you with the wisdom and the beauty of the way they preserve their cosmology and their history, and they taught their children about the magic that was that was a part of their history. Um, it's a way of relating facts to people that uh, implant seeds in their minds and stay with them forever, and I think it's something we should all pay attention to and utilize within our lives. Now back to Mary, to Mary Joyce. She is the editor of one of the most amazing websites out there. I encourage all of you to seek it out, look at it, wait till the show's over. It's, it's called skyshipsovercashiers.com, and Mary is the editor, and she publishes all sorts of amazing uh, news stories that, that uh, don't make the local newspapers, but certainly are of great relevance to our lives. And uh, the, the website is set up so that it's, a, it's an easy read. It's a fascinating read. It will, it will definitely titillate you for sure, and, and uh, she has about oh, over 10 years of archives that are on there so that you can search a topic throughout the last decade or so and see all of the things she has gathered on different topics. And she is <clears throat> the consummate reporter. She doesn't put stuff up unless she's confirmed it, which makes the material even more exciting. And tonight we're going to be covering... Um, the, some of the latest articles that she has she has brought forth about Dr. Werner von Braun and some of his conversations with um, one of the astronauts, uh, Clark McClellan, and some of the things that they talked about, which are now um, making it into the general in, into the public eye, so to speak. And um, I can't wait for her to talk about this stuff because it is phenomenal. So. Um, without further ado, welcome to the show, Mary. Hi, I'm glad to hear you. <laughs> glad to hear you, too. <laughs> Anyhow, I hope you're having a great evening. I am. I'm having a fabulous evening, and this is the greatest way for me to um, kind of put the whipped cream on the top with the cherry, because the material that you put up on your on your website is is so amazing, and um, it's, you know, for the longest time I would always buy the garbage newspapers when I went through the grocery line, and then I realized I didn't know half the people, or three quarters, well, most of the people today, that, that were written about, but <clears throat> it was garbage news. You just knew it was garbage news, and and that there was very little truth to it, but, but with your website, um, because of your background, you're meticulous about making sure that, that your material is researched and, and to the best of your ability validated. And I, I so respect the work that you do when, when, you, when you do post the things that you do post. 
Well, what you and I talked about um, uh, before the show was to talk about uh, Von Braun's uh, private revelations about Mars and ETs. And uh -huh. as far as I know, that hasn't been put out there uh, until just really, really recently. I think your audience might be interested in how I even came to do this story, and I think in the process it adds credibility to the story. And okay. it started on May 17th, and I had one of these big urges to go and look up Clark McClellan, uh, who I met back in 1989. Uh, have never been in touch with him since then, but spent a couple hours with him back, you know, it's decades ago now. And <laughs> so I went to look him up. Well, I found out, first of all, that he died in April of this year, on the 22nd, and I also found out that uh, he had been providing his papers, his private papers, um, to somebody else to publish as a book after his death because the government had blocked all of his efforts to publish anything when he was still alive. It just wasn't going to happen. So I actually, made, I actually started looking him up on the day that the book was released, which oh I found kind of kind of interesting right off the bat. And um, Clark McClellan uh, is really the one that connects me to this story. And when I lived on Cocoa Beach between Patrick Air Force Base and the Kennedy Space Center, I met him and other uh, mostly engineers who worked at NASA. He was an aerospace engineer for 35 years. He was trained as an astronaut and specially trained as a spacecraft operator. And that, his job was to test, operate, and solve any vehicle problems from, the, from ground control. So he was very, very knowledgeable. While he was working um, on the, um, uh, let's see which one it was, it was the Saturn uh, One mission. That's when he became friends with uh, Werner von Braun. Uh, not only were they working on the same project, they were both engineers, aero aeronautic, I'm not talking well tonight, aeronautic uh, uh, engineers, but um, they also had an extreme interest uh, in astronomy, in life on other planets, and this friendship developed. Well, what would happen is that uh, Von Braun would come in from Houston, um, you know, when this project was going on, he would especially take time with Clark when they would have award ceremonies. And they would have these at the different hotels on Cocoa Beach. And uh, Von Braun, who was a smoker, uh, would take smoke breaks, and he would call Clark out to join him. And the two of them would sit on lounge chairs, either by the pool or overlooking the ocean. And that's when these natural, uh, very human conversations developed. And so knowing that setting, um, I think, gives some credibility to the information. I couldn't rely on my own memory of many things because uh, it was a long time ago. So I got a hold of this book, and then I was able to quote things uh, and not rely on my bad memory. So um, what he said was really quite fascinating. He was um, back in the 60s. He believed that there had been advanced life on Mars. He believed that um, that uh, debris the, uh, field between uh, Mars and Jupiter, you know, was a planet that exploded, and in the process, it destroyed the atmosphere uh, on Mars. Um, he felt at that time there was a very um, technologically advanced uh, civilization on Mars and that they were capable of space travel, and that when their atmosphere uh, was being destroyed, um, he felt like they, he believed very strongly that they had the capacity to, uh, you know, flee the place. The closest place to flee was Earth. And he made a statement uh, which kind of stood out in my mind, and he told Clark that he felt that uh, uh, at least some of the people in our culture today may be Martians, which I thought was an interesting statement. Um, he talked about that he felt there were still life forms that were, I don't mean low life forms, I mean intelligent life forms that were still uh -huh. living on Mars, probably beneath the surface. 
so those are some of the things that he uh, shared with um, Clark when they were out on the beach. Wow, that that might even um, explain the Rh negative factor too. Uh, there, uh, people have tied that to the uh, to that idea and also to the Atlantans. Um, the Basque people, uh, what is it in northern France? They have uh -huh. a high percentage of um, the Rh negative. Uh, and have a very, you know, uh, nice look about them, you know, with the light eyes and the, the fair skin. Um, and many people have speculated that they were remnants of the civilization of Atlantis that, you know, went under. And their language is totally different. It doesn't relate to any other kind of language. Um, and there's a number of reasons that they think there might be that, you know, distant past uh, DNA connection. It might have been Atlantis. It might have been uh, the Martians. Who knows? But um, it's an interesting angle to pursue. And, you know, it also could possibly explain, and, and this is a big reach, but um, there are um, throughout, throughout history, especially on, on the metaphysical thing, um, there are um, mentions of the, the shining ones or the light ones. And they, they have been, it's been speculated that they were a, a very advanced race that, that came to Earth before, um, before human homo sapiens. It really evolved, homo sapiens. right? Yeah. And that, that um, there's, there's talk of them in a number of places and, um, I, I'm I'm hunting as much material as I can up about them because it makes sense to me that that they may well have been a civilization that came to Earth and and um, sort of seeded the planet with humanity. Well, and one of the that, statements that von Braun made was he said that the Earth is a nursery of many cosmic races from the stars. Ah. He also said we are being visited by other intelligences uh, from other stars. And um, when Clark asked him some questions, um, he not only admitted that he had seen UFOs in Germany and in the USA, but that um, he had actually met um, uh, somebody of the Aryan race that comes from um, Aldebaran. Uh, I'm probably saying that wrong, but it's a star, giant star formation in the uh, and uh, uh, he said, yes, I have seen real ETs from that particular star system. And he's seen them himself. Wow. He said, and, I, I, and Clark asked him what they look like, and he said they're taller, and many have uh -huh. the blonde hair and blue eyes. I have heard others of us Germans at the Kennedy uh -huh. Space Center admit they saw them. Yeah, that's been... Um a description that, that not only um, has come from, from Von Braun, because that I've read before, but Billy Meyer also describes um, some of the visitors that way as well. So that, uh, but, but to actually have met some or seen some, that's, you know, what, what a come down to have them look so much like us that you can't, you know, you can't tell the difference, <laughs> you know. You kind of think that, you know, where's the antennas and stuff like that. Um, uh, apparently they're not all looking uh, gray and, and reptilian and, and, and very strange. Uh, uh, even when I was uh, doing a lecture, actually maybe a good decade ago, out in Las Vegas, or actually Laughlin, and it was the International uh, UFO Congress, and there was a, a, a little guy who looked human who was on the elevator with me during that convention, I swear to God, he was an alien. I mean, there was just something about him that was just very, very peculiar. And he kind of, um, I don't know, he kind of glided away. It was a very <laughs> uh, strange, strange feeling. So, well, yes, considering, I think can... but, but considering that they've been here for possibly millions of years, uh, I mean, some of them, um, it, it's kind of like they're, they're as much Earthlings as we are in some cases. Um, and uh, the name of, that's what it seems to be. 
The name of McClellan's book is Space, the Final Frontier. Um, and you know, I, when I was speaking to you earlier, you said it's, it's, it's not an easy read, but it's a fascinating one, I would think. Yeah, and I was telling you how I read it. Um, um, it's got an index in the front, and so I always have a, I destroy all books with yellow highlighters. And uh -huh. so what I did was I would read the chapters that I was the most intensely interested in and then cross them off and, you know, go down the line. So it was sort of like I wanted my dessert first. <laughs> well, yeah, I would too. I would, I would pick the, the elements that, you know, really kind of, um, uh, you know, appeal to, to, to me and, and, and uh, kind of enticed me into this one I have to read. One of the other ones that, one of the other articles you've got up that, that you know, goes into, you know, or, or comes close to being connected to this book was the fact that the Challenger was sabotaged. Uh, yes, and again, I knew of some of this when I lived there in Florida, but uh -huh. I'm not going to quote my bad memory. Um, so when his book came out, I was able to do um, not only the article about von Braun, but I did uh, several with the title uh, NASA Secrets. And one NASA secret was the space uh, shuttle Challenger was sabotaged. Uh, another one was uh, an ET was caught twice by NASA cameras, um, you know, on the, on the space shuttle. Um, uh -huh. That there are Nazis in Antarctica and that there are ET structures uh, and evidence of mining on the moon. And those were all ones where I was able to, you know, read his book and pull from something concrete, um, and that's important. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I love the fact that you, you, you confirm before you report, and, you know, that's, um, that's so important. Um, and, and, you know, it's so sad that he's, you know, passed away because, of course, I love to read a book and then talk to the author. And so unless I channel him. Oh, that would have uh, been a good one. <laughs> that would have been a real good one. But it's really quite sad. I won't um, elaborate on it a whole lot. But uh, um, Clark McClellan felt very, very strongly that the public had a right to know more than the government was allowing the public to know. Uh -huh. And he basically got in trouble uh, because he didn't totally keep his mouth shut. And even though he'd been there for 35 years and had key positions, um, they, they got rid of him. And uh, after 35 years, not only did he lose his job, uh, he lost all of his benefits, and they kept blackballing him so that he couldn't get other jobs. Um, they interfered so he couldn't publish his information. And so in many ways, he uh, really suffered um, in the later years of his life. Well, you know, it's, it's the uh, government supposedly, and, and, and I say this, you know, with a smirk on my face, releasing, you know, all their information on UFOs, and you just know that they're not. I mean, the reality is a UFO is an unidentified flying object, yes. There are lots of them out there, but, but they could be ours or Russia's or Japan's or China's or, or Korea's or, you know, they, they could be Mexican. They could be, I mean, it, it, a UFO doesn't necessarily say there are little green men inside ready to invade the planet. So, right. it, it, you know, at but this the fact, point... But the, they, they don't want people to think that they, you know, they're, they're still fighting the release of information that there is intelligence that is not human that's operating these vehicles. And some exactly. of the most convincing evidence that I've found, for example, uh, there is a, a, a SOHO satellite, there's two of them actually, that monitor the sun and take a picture every 15 minutes, and there's one on each uh -huh. side of the sun. You can actually monitor the feed from that, which I occasionally do. And we have published uh, in the past uh, photos of these humongous, uh, ships uh, near the sun, and they're all bigger than the planet Jupiter. Uh, and there's no way that we humans could build something like that. So when you look at those kind of things, you know, this, this idea of, you know, scooting around the reality of, 
uh, ET intelligence out there is just ridiculous. Um, also, let me share with you something that I haven't even posted yet. It's going to go on the website, oh, I don't know, maybe by the end of the week. Um, but I was doing some investigation uh, with Google Earth Mars. It's one of the little detective things I do periodically. And I have found some incredible things um, on the planet. And the most recent thing is I found 27 entrances into Mars and they're all in a line. And they stretch out over 16 miles, and they're not small. Uh, the smallest one that um, I was able to measure was uh, 399 feet. Well, say it's 400. 400 feet, that's like four football fields. That's no small entrance. And the biggest one is over 1,000 feet. And in the past, going back a number of years now, I have discovered entrances into the planet before but in this case I quit looking at it with the north at the top I put the north in the east position so I was looking at the you know the planet from a different direction and I found uh -huh. these things all lined up which I would not have found if I had just scooted around with north in its normal position um, but 27 of those in a line spread out over 16 uh, miles, uh, you know, that's not something regular. And these these are square cut entrances, like garage entrances. Uh, uh, they're they're huge. Wow. Uh, who, who's doing those? And then I've um, twice I've gotten photos again from Google Earth Mars of uh, UFOs, big ones that are spaceships that have landed on the surface uh, of the planet. And, you know, one of them, I think, is like three and a half um, miles in diameter. That is no small little ship. Another uh -huh. one, uh, probably in the same size, I don't have the figures right in front of me right now, but this, you can see the skid mark. And it was over, I think, 4,000 feet before it actually, you know, hit the Martian soil in a, in a significant way and came to a halt. Um, don't tell me there's not ET uh, life out there that's, uh, you know, beyond what they're letting us see right now. I love it. I mean, you're, you're a cosmic archaeologist. Uh, I don't know if there is such a thing, but it is your, it's, you know, you don't always come up with, with treasures that you find, but when you do, it's kind of, kind of thrilling. Well, yeah, I mean, you've, you've, put, you've put some phenomenal... Um, screenshots up on your website over time that I mean there's no way that it's that it's uh, that, that, that these are natural occurrences I mean they're obviously man-made or they're I guess man-made is not a proper term but they're they're they're, in, they're, they're not intelligently made they're they're made Thank by you. intelligent <laughs> beings I, I don't know how else to clarify it and that's not the only thing uh, so I found entrances I found UFOs and I have found two uh, space stations. Uh, they look like biospheres. The first one I found was back in 2011. And so, you know, you can go back into those files and you can find it for yourself. But it was 652, more than 652 miles in length. Again, no small thing. Uh, then five years later in 2016, I found a larger one at the South Pole. And this was over 7,000 feet in length. Again, no small thing. And uh, I tied it together with um, uh, some research that was done by uh, a concept artist. And uh, his name is Brian Verstig. Uh, I'm sure I don't know how to say it. But he does conceptual drawings for space exploration, and he does it for deep space industries and inner orbital systems and the Mars Foundation and National Geographic and New Science and Mars Exploration Magazine. So he is very well known. So in one article, again, back in the 2016 archives, um, I show one of the illustrations and then uh, the actual biosphere on Mars. Now, the one on Mars is more blurry, but it clearly is not some kind of... Uh, natural phenomena wow i you know i would be so shocked if you didn't send a whole bunch of people to google 
Earth for the Moon and Mars because um, I, I know that 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 you know th this is you know first of all our government can't can't um, airbrush all of this out and but and, they do you know, sometimes there have been times uh, Barbara when I have found something posted it on the website and within the next day or two days later. It has been blurred out. Uh, new strips have been put in there, and they've done uh, things to, you know, make it unfindable. And um, that indicates to me that whatever I have shown is a very active place. Well, yeah, and and even even the Antarctic. Um, I mean, that's something that. I, I mean, we had Operation High Jump with Admiral Berg, and. You know they they've all they've kind of let it all go now. There are there are all sorts of um, exploration teams in in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, but they they have been told not to fly over certain places and things like that, which leads one to believe that there's something they're trying to hide there. Of course. And now one of the I've used the same you know Google detective tool in Antarctica. And that's a really good example of where they have blurred things out almost instantly. I found two very large entrances into Antarctica. And uh, the largest one where you could fly a major jet into with, you know, 50 feet on each side of the wingtips, um, uh -huh. it's like somebody spilled India ink on it uh, the, the following day that I had it posted. So if anybody starts becoming a, a Google Earth detective, and you see something interesting, take a screenshot. And every keyboard, uh, as far as I know, has something that says print screen. And just hit that and put it in your files and save it just in case it's one of those things that um, will, will disappear. And to be helpful to people, uh, almost always, sometimes I can't do it, but almost always I have the coordinates for what I have found. So you can yeah. copy it and put it right into the search bar for Google Earth, Mars, or Google Earth, and uh, it'll take you right to the spot that I'm talking about. And I do that because we have so many blankety-blank blank people who get a kick out of Photoshopping stuff that isn't real. And so when you find real things, you have to bend over backwards to, like, prove that it's real. Uh-huh. Well, <clears throat> it... it it is fascinating to me. I, I, especially with those large ships. Those, I, I guess, mothership is the best term I can use. The, the, the huge ones around the moon. I've always thought that those large ships and the smaller ones, but but you know the bigger ones more importantly. I do believe that that in some way they they gather energy or fuel from from being that close to the sun. I, I don't think they're there to improve their tans. I think that there's I a totally reason. I totally agree that with you. <clears throat> We've got one photo where there is a round UFO, <clears throat> like with an umbilical cord, that connects to the sun. It stayed there for, I don't know, a considerable length of time before it disconnected. And that would certainly support what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, you know, I go back to Star Trek, and I'm not sure what they used for fuel, but... Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I true there there over the last thirty or forty years there have there have been every now and then, you know, the pictures of these large objects really close to the sun. Obviously not burning up. So that right. uh, there has to be a reason that they're that close. And the only thing I could think of was, you know, it's not a it's not a cruise ship, ship that's, you know, doing a tourist thing to the planets and stuff like that. Well maybe it I, is. I, maybe it is. Well, if it is, then then Planet Earth is probably a comedy channel that you know they're they're getting a big kick out of most of the time because of how we're behaving down here. Uh, there's two um, reasons that I think that. Part of it is um, there was a man in the Netherlands who got in touch with me back in 2013 and 2014, and then it's like he just disappeared. But he would take these um, original NASA satellite photos that had captured these large object, objects around the sun. And then he had the ability to use his computer skills to get rid of the debris and the interference and enlarge oh. these images. Incredible detail. And if people want to take a look at some of his stuff, 
uh, go to our global links section. In fact, most of what we're talking about is in global links. <clears throat> and, and open up the 2013 archives, scroll way down to the, to the bottom, and then start scrolling back up because uh -huh. the way the, the um, sections work, you know, you build on top of what you've already put in there. So the beginning uh -huh. of 2013 is at the bottom. Gotcha. Well, you know, when you stop and think about it, um, solar panels gather energy to create electricity. So being that close to the sun and yet not there, solar flares probably put out high-intensity energy. Obviously they do. I mean, they, the, those sun, sun flares can disturb our atmosphere and, and everything. So being that close to it, it's a, it's a powerful energy. And if there's a way of... of um, drawing it in and utilizing it for fuel, holy mackerel, that, that's, that's amazing. But, uh, uh, I used to wonder how they do it, but uh, yeah, it's, it, you're right. Well, and, and, and almost... Can... Go ahead. Almost, almost every, every uh, you know, there, there are suns all over the place, so that hopping around the, the galaxy, w there would be no limit to fuel so that it wouldn't be something you had to store. It, it could be something that you, you know, could could regenerate whenever you had to, which would be so um, cool. You know, going back to the idea of uh, cruise ships going through the universe, uh, uh -huh. there is a uh -huh. man who you may be familiar with. His name is Charles Hall. And when he was in the military, <clears throat> he was uh, uh, a weatherman, and a weatherman that went out and set up the balloons and, you know, made sure everything was all right. He was uh, near Area 51. And nobody wanted the job that he had, not because the weather job was bad, but these people that would get sent out there, they would freak out. And he was the only one that didn't totally freak out and run away. And there yeah. were what he called the tall white ETs that um, uh, had, a, uh, under, had a base there that the government knew about, the government allowed, and he talked about these ships would come in and stay for X amount of time and then take off, and he made it sound like it was a bus, you know, that just pulled into Earth, you know, and brought tourists. <laughs> and he, he was very brave, as I said, because the other officers ran away, um, and he just overcame his fear. It wasn't that he wasn't fearful. And... What eventually happened was uh, some of the tall white ETs, especially the women, would like to get dressed up and try to pass as humans, and they would go into Las Vegas, which, you know, is a goofy town to start with, so if people see yeah. strange people, they're not going to get all bent out of shape like they might right. if you landed in the middle of St. Louis. And um, uh, it was like a challenge for them to um, kind of... I don't know, pass the sniff test, I guess. Blend in, yeah. I so, remember this story. This this was a great story. I remember this. I can't remember where it was, you know, time-wise on your, on your website, but I do remember it, and it was fascinating. Long time ago, because yeah. I can't remember all the details. Yeah, I, I remember that they, uh, they didn't want him getting near the kids, that they, they they took the kids out to play, but they were very protective of them. Right. They and, had these um, wand, I'll call it a magic wand, and if uh, they felt like they were being threatened, uh, they could zap you with it. And they actually yeah. were afraid of humans because we have a whole lot more body strength than they have because they are a kind of frail-looking, tall, white ETs. Um, yeah. So are, are we, I guess it was... To them, we must have been like confronting a gorilla in the forest or in the jungle. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah, they were very careful that their children weren't messed with. But and, they also the brought wit. the children to observe him. Oh, yeah, like that a was zoo. Like a, yeah, well, I don't know if it was quite like that, but it was a, a form of entertainment that they could bring the kids out and, and watch him do his work or whatever he did. And the women loved the catalogs. Yes, yes. Very good. Good memory. I'm not sure I would have brought that up on my own. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I happen to be a catalog freak, too. So, you know, it's like, of course they like the catalogs. 
but um, but and, but the army did supply them with catalogs for clothing and stuff, so that mm -hmm. so that um, yeah, there was a cooperative you know, arrangement with the with the tall whites. Now, what they what the uh, part of the military was doing that he would not have known about, I have no idea. But uh, you know, they would bring their uh, park their ships, um, let's say, in a garage in a mountain, and then the side of the mountain would close up, and it looked like nothing was there. Huh. So, yeah, I think, know, crew, I think there's cruise ships going around the universe, and every once in a while they make stops here at Earth. Well, I wish they'd tell us about things like the Nazca lines and stuff like that, because that, that still remains, you know, an amazing mystery to me. Um, it's, it's not galactic graffiti, I'm sure, but um, there's something else there, and I don't know what it is. I know there's metal under what what one would consider the runways and stuff, but um, they, they, they sliced the top of a mountain off to create that space. <laughs> yeah, that was quite impressive. It really is. Yeah, not, not an easy feat, you know. It, 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 and, and there's no piles of rubble so that they not only sliced it off, but they dis disposed of the material. Right, and so how did they do that? I don't know. <laughs> you just, whoops, excuse me, I just dropped my phone. Um, um, well, that's okay. <laughs> another thing I wanted to tell you um, that we had posted again uh, based on information from Clark's book uh, was he was friends with um, uh, David Scott, who was uh, one of the crew members of the Apollo 15. And uh -huh. they were buddies. And so he talked to uh, Clark, and he told him that uh, they had seen whitish metallic objects flying overhead when they were, you know, headed toward moon, the moon. And he described them as, quote, they were very fast critters. And that sounds like a legitimate uh, quote, to, you know, say the least. Um, oh, yeah. He also saw structures off in the distance, um, and he said they were like glass or crystalline. Um, uh-huh. He talked about finding tracks for some kind of a vehicle, and nobody, uh, neither from our country or Russia or Japan or anybody else who might have advanced technology, uh, had been up there with a vehicle of any kind, and yet there were these tracks. And when they followed the tracks, there, was, there were signs that there was a mining operation going on. So I thought, the, oh, and another thing, this shows you how they keep clamping down on these people that have so much information. Um, mm -hmm. uh, David Scott had taken uh, 15 photos uh, when he was when seeing all this, and they took them away from him. And he want he you know he took them. He really wanted to see them again or you know have them again, and so they yeah. let him see one, just one of those 15 photos. And it had already been, um, the structures had already been erased. Photoshopped, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It does, it does make you wonder, I mean, because, because of the Internet, because of the way information gets out there today, um, keeping this stuff under wraps is stupid because it is out there. Um, the other, one of the things I'd love to see is the contract with the aliens that Eisenhower signed. Yeah, that would be interesting to read, wouldn't it? Well, and it it, it makes and and you know when I when I heard about that, I thought how stupid is that? It's like it's like it's like we made contracts with the Indians which we had no intention of keeping. Why would an alien race? Make a contract with a primitive world like this, and 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 expect that you know we would respect it. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. If they if they wanted to test people, they you know they could just go ahead and test it. We couldn't stop them. That's so correct. so it and apparently, what what I understand is the ET. Now we're talking grays. Now they didn't yeah. live up to their end of the bargain. And I guess there, as I understand it, uh, there was an agreement that the ETs could abduct, you know, like a small number of people, uh -huh. um, 
in exchange for technological information. Well, they they didn't stay within the limits. I mean, the abduction stories are you know quite phenomenal. Um, I mean, what is interesting that I, I talked to one gal um, myself a bunch of years ago, and we did we did do a story on her, and she was abducted. Uh, the traditional story that you hear, but she saw uh, U.S. military soldiers there also. So what's going on? Well, it, and if that's the case, then, you know, if, if there were soldiers there, there are soldiers or, or you know, at Area 51, uh, my friend, uh, my good friend Jeannie, who was the co-host for me originally way back, her father was one of the guards at Area 51. And um, he never said anything to any of his family. He would just That's smile typical. and wait. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, I mean, it's, it's a terrible, cold thing to say, but yeah, on his deathbed, you know, couldn't he have whispered, you know, yes, there were aliens there, or something, right. you know. Some, some of the people do. Some of the people do when they finally get to the point where they realize uh, you know, they're on the way out. Uh, some of them have come clean. I just, but think you of know, the burden you, that these, these people have carried with them for usually decades. Right. And and what, what I mean, if there were no conspiracy theorists out there or if there was no other information out there, keeping a secret a secret, you know, okay, I got that. But because the information is so much a part of our everyday life that they're, I mean, all they have is their own personal experience. They don't have anything that they can prove their stories to. So, so why, why hold them to that kind of a, a secretive thing? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, the Rendlesham Forest guy who got the download of the um, binary code that talked of a a future generation of us, I think by 800 years or so, um, why has that been kept under wraps? Why, why? I, I, I mean, originally they did a study and their, their conclusion was that the public couldn't take knowledge of the fact that there were well, actually you know, aliens here. I, I used to feel very, very strongly that it was, you know, that the public could handle it. But what I've uh -huh. seen in the last four, five, six years, uh, when I see all these people with the QAnon theories, when I see these people and all these conspiracies that they come up with, when I see people scared to death to do this or that, and I see the level of fear in so many people, and I see the level of, I don't know, I, I, I want to say lack of education, I mean basic education, basic curiosity, there's a lot more of that in our world than I ever thought there was. And so maybe we would have a mess on our hands if, if this got revealed too quickly. Maybe there's some truth to that. But they're hiding way too much. And this, I don't know what to say. Well, I mean, okay, so, so we have aliens pouring in over our borders. And, no. you know, <laughs> I mean, we already have aliens. <laughs> so... Um, I, the fact that, that, that our government has, has hid from us the fact that they are, if indeed they are, in contact with alien races from, from other planetary systems. Um, but but, but when, you, when you look at where the information is, even the current government doesn't know about it. And so that makes one wonder who is actually in charge. Right. And there's certainly uh, those within our known government who know what we're ta you and I are now talking about. They absolutely know. But I don't doubt for a minute that there is a level of um, control and power that goes way beyond that. Um, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to dig up the information that I want, but there is a secret space um, program. And <laughs> yes, I there is. Like I, well, I mean that they, somebody has been acknowledging, and I'm going, I need to find out more about that. Well, but Corey Goodwin is part of it. 
I just can't I say that again. Corey Good was part of it. He was on the 20 and back. Um, uh, Laura Eisenhower was su supposedly, they tried to draft her into it, and she said no. Have you ever watched the Above Majestic um, YouTube? Um, mm, I don't think so. Check out Above Majestic. I, I think you have to pay 4 or $5 or something like that to actually see it. <clears throat> it's two hours of, of amazing material, and um, it's, it's the kind you can check. Mm. Okay. But, but I, think, I think we have to get you an interview with Corey Good. Be because um. have, or, or have you interviewed him already? <laughs> No, I have not. I have not. Um, mainly because it's really hard to um, to make that believable for people. I know, but but today it's, it's, it's know, very very difficult. But um, and probably it, that would be a big reason I haven't tackled that one. Well, yeah, I you know you you have no way of proving it and. And if you did have a way of proving it, you'd probably disappear. So, yeah, and I'm um, not ready for that. No, <laughs> but but you know, look at all of the things that you're getting little tidbits on. You're getting little tidbits on the the Antarctic stuff. You're getting tidbits on the the, the lunar stuff and and Mars stuff. And you know, ten years ago, this wouldn't wouldn't have been even something that you would be able to put out there for fear. You know, people would say, oh, that's just garbage, but not today. Now now people eat this up and, and want to find more material on it. So, right, so and that's general, encouraging. The general public is far more educated. Um, if, if aliens came to, well, if interterrestrial aliens came to my door, now you have to be specific about what kind of alien you're talking about, um, came to my door, nah, I'd ask him in and offer him a drink. Um, or her, or whatever. I, I just think that, I think we are so much more mature as far as the probability of what's out there. I mean, when, when the book, um, when Stryber's book came out, was that Contact? What was the name of that book? That, that, it's the um, one with the uh, alien face, or the uh, gray face on it. Um, yeah. I, I found it very unsettling. I, I, I do remember that. Well, you know, and I, have, I hate to say this, and, and, you know, I probably will never get Whit Whitley Schreiber on the show because of it. I think he is an amazingly great science fiction author. And? But I don't, buy, I don't buy the book at all. Uh, I, I all do. I know is it was unsettling, and it didn't feel right to me, and I even went and bought another one of his books, and I was left with that same unsettled feeling. Um, so no, I, I've never done yeah, a, no, never it, done a story on his books. It didn't it didn't ring true to me. That's it how was I felt. Like, it was like you know he's a great science fiction author, and, but and I feel the same way about um, Zachariah Sitchkin. He's dead, so no chance he'd be on the show anyhow. Um, Patrick, um, my late husband, uh, hated people comparing him with Sitchkin because. Patrick's work was all validated by what was in the Bible, and 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 Sitchkin was sort of misquoting the Bible to his own purposes in many places. But there are people that quote his his books chapter and verse, the same as there mm. are biblical people who quote chapter and verse. Mm -hmm. And so, so you know, our capacity to investigate and embrace is great. Our discernment leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> that, well, that's, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. And you just have to go with, I don't know, all we really have is what I call that gut feeling. And yeah. if it feels unsettled, uh, then leave it alone. Don't, don't mess with it. And there's well, been a number look... of topics where, where I feel that way. And then there's times when I'm just driven to do something, like i got to do this. And mm -hmm. uh, like that, that's what happened when I... Um, looked up uh, Clark McClellan after decades, and it was on the day his book was published. I'm going, oh, okay, that's why I was nudged. 
How synchronistic is that? Yeah, I, I, right. Well, and and I, I had such <laughs> compassion for him when I met him because he was still working for NASA. Uh, I think he, I think his final year was, I think it was 91. I met him in 89. But they were already, you know, making moves on him. And uh, I saw I saw fear, I saw anger, I saw frustration. Um, I had such compassion for him. And when this uh, book of his came out, um, I decided I would do my part to um, share at least some of his information. Well, I, I think you did a great job. I, I know that it, it's interesting because... Um, I saw a UFO. It landed on my campus was when, I, when I was in college. And the, the abuse you take when you admit that you've seen something like that. And, you know, I had no pictures. I have no way to prove it. I saw It would have UFO. been terrible then. I don't think it would be terrible now. Oh, no. Now it's not. Now it would be hell. You know, that's really cool. And, you know, what are you having for lunch? Um, but... But over the years, now that, that was in the in the um, in the sixties, and the 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 mental abuse you get, and people were saying, you know, don't talk about that because people will think you're crazy, and mm -hmm. and it's sort of like, but I know what I saw. I'm not nuts. I know. Well, what they I deliberately saw. tried to make people feel like they were crazy. Oh yeah. I mean that was there, a, that was a technique. No doubt about it. And when when I you know interviewed for jobs and stuff like that, and they saw where I went to school, it was like, did you see the UFO? I said, yeah, I was there when that landed, and mm -hmm. I I wouldn't go further um, because mm -hmm. you know you're crazy if you believe in that stuff. And and mm -hmm. J. Allen Hynek was out there declaring everything was swamp gas. And, and he changed what his I saw eventually too, didn't he? Oh, he did, but it was many years later. Right. And, you know, he was doing what the government wanted him to do, which was cover up something that they couldn't explain. So, you know, it's, it's – but then when they did that study and they decided that – what was it? That, that the UFOs did not pose any threat and that they weren't going to talk about them because the public couldn't handle it. But that that has been the procedure for the – for, for for decades about all of this stuff. Look at look at the the battle for Los Angeles with those UFOs that we fired on, and and our shells just bounced out off their their shields. I mean, we interviewed Patrick and I interviewed a, a, a man um, who lived there, observed it, and he went out on the beaches the next day and picked up the debris. And the government paid him for every piece of debris he, he brought to them. Wow. So, I mean, these things have been happening. And, and they're just, they're pretending they don't happen. They're pretending that, you know, that, that we're living in a, in a bubble. And um, so someday this bubble's going to burst and a ton of information is going to be released. I think what the government has released is, is just sheer and utter garbage. It's just, it's baby stuff. That's just baby stuff so yeah I mean let me throw out it, another it, idea just to get everybody's minds working um, okay I've done an article read the book uh, by William Tompkins I won't get into it a whole lot but he he was a confidential advisor to Von Braun and uh, Dubus who was the second in command with the rocketry okay so that's the essence of him uh -huh. and he uh, again in his older years uh, said that there were uh, Pleiadian ETs working at NASA, and that they uh, were very attractive um, women that uh, supposedly were hired as secretaries, but they were the ones that were giving them information, and every time they did, it worked, and it was because of them that the space program after, uh, you know, Kennedy essentially launched it, that was the reason it uh, grew so rapidly. So I was thinking about that, and then I saw an old rerun of uh, Jeannie, uh, the old TV show. Yeah. Do you remember that? I Dream of Jeannie. That's, that's the name of it. And yeah. she was like this magical person 
working with the people at the Space Center or in the Air Force at that time period, and I'm going, could that have inspired that show? Could somebody have had oh, wow. enough inside information that they could have inspired that show to come in, into existence? Well, How's that for, um, for, for uh, I don't know, fiction, if nothing else? I, I think that, you know, you've you got a point. And I know they showed a picture of um, one of those, uh, of Maria Orsak. Orsash, I, I can't pronounce her last right, name. Right, back in the Hitler days. Mm -hmm. Back in the Hitler days, that she was supplying the, the Nazis with information, and somebody showed Billy Meyer a picture of her, and, he, and his reaction immediately was, that's Semyasi, that's, that's the alien that I worked with for so many years. And so, very attractive, right? Oh, very attractive, yes. Long blonde hair, very Nordic looking. Mm -hmm. Beautiful woman. Um, yep. Not that we don't have beautiful people on this planet. You well, know, they're hard to find down here, though. You know, we seem to have really messed up our DNA. Yeah, that's, that's very true. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I hate to think that anybody who's actually, you know, qualifies as quote unquote beautiful now could possibly be an alien with, with pure, a purer form of DNA than we have today. But, um, yeah, no, I, I think that, that, you know, I, and, and it ha it's going to have to be, it can't be the government releasing information because I don't think the government has the information. I believe that, that you know, there's got to be a, a, uh, a deep state of some sort that has the information that we're looking for. Um, because, because you know, it would seem to me that I know Kennedy was going to release information, and he was, uh, he died. Um, so, was that part of the reason he was he was gotten rid of? I don't know. But it, I don't know either. So but many, many people, many people have said that they think that's the reason he was killed, because he was going to, you know, make this public. Well, and. If I can't remember where I, I read it or saw it or whatever, but I do believe that um, Donald Trump was briefed on the whole um, secret space program, and that's why he formed the space program, so that it would be there and open so it could merge into the program that's already out there and, and fully functional. Yeah, I think the program um, was there long before Donald Trump, and I doubt very oh. much that they shared very much information with him. No, I, I don't think he was given details, but I think he was made aware that there was already a program out there, and so he created um, one in reality so that so that at some point in time they could merge together, I think. Um, I, I, I read someplace that, that he had been briefed to a degree, and um, I think Above Majestic was probably where I, where I heard that. That, that the presidents now were being briefed, starting with Trump. But I don't know. I, I don't know if Biden has been briefed, and you know, don't get me started there. But um, from what I understand, I think the uh, older George Bush uh, knew a lot. I mean, oh, yeah. he was the one. He was the one that uh, uh, told Jimmy Carter he he, he didn't he didn't have enough. Um, I don't know. He didn't. He didn't have a right to know. Now that's pretty gutsy. Yeah, it's um, it's it's very much like that. The um, well, Independence Day, where the president is told, "Well, you didn't need to know," and mm -hmm. and um, and one of the other characters said, "Do you really believe there's a five hundred dollar toilet seat?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Interesting. So anyhow, let me do a plug again for uh, Clark's book. It's called Space, okay. The Final Frontier. That, that's the big title. And the uh, secondary title is Secrets NASA Doesn't Want You to Know. Space, The Final Frontier, Secrets NASA Doesn't Want You to Know. And I think anybody who's deeply interested in these kind of subjects would find it interesting. Uh, for people who just like casual, easy reading, I don't think it's for them. Uh, not that it's uh -huh. that hard to read, but it gets into a lot of stuff that uh, people may or may not want to know. But there's a lot of good information in, the, in there for the sincerely curious people. 
Okay, and your website is skyshipsovercashiers.com. Everybody should now. Everybody should go look at it. Um, I just we're, we're down to the final seconds uh, again, Mary. Thanks so much for sharing all your information with us. It's just always such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, and I enjoy talking to you. Sorry, I trip over my tongue sometimes. Well, yeah, welcome to my world. <laughs> Clearly, no, no, we're not no, no, no. aliens. <laughs> we're very human. Uh, but but I look forward to you coming back again next month and, and um, inspiring us and, and titling us so that we start looking outside of our reality and inside of ourselves. So thanks uh-huh. again, and uh, we will talk to you next month. You take care. You too. Bye-bye now. And good night, everybody. Check us out on YouTube. And uh, let us know you're there by subscribing to our channel and keeping us uh, on our toes and making sure that we are sharing with you um, the best information that we can find out there to keep you curious and informed and entertained and um, challenge you to look a little bit deeper into a lot of things. Good night now.